Get this and get it straight. Crime is a sucker's road. And those who travel it wind up in the gut of the prison of the grave. This time a nervous breakdown in a driving rain. A cape with a high collar and a tiny sliver of glass led me from the ballet and a beautiful dancer to the edge of a cliff and death. It happened like this. From the pen of Raymond Chandler, outstanding author of crime fiction, comes his most famous character in The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. Now, with Gerald Moore, starred as Philip Marlowe, we bring you tonight's exciting story, The High-Colored Cape. Nothing like a drink and a good book on a rainy night. Mm. And what a night. <sighs> oh, no. All right. All right, don't sprain your finger. I'm most sorry to intrude on you this time at night, but I, I may have waited too long already. Yeah, well, look, miss, my office hours are 9 to... Uh, I, I felt something dreadful was going to happen to him, and now, now I'm sure of it. You must find him for me. The poor lady, man Lady, is... wait a minute. Hold it, will you? Who is Andre? And for that matter, who are you? I, I am Vivian Ortway, prima ballerina ballet du monde. Prima ballerina? The empresario of the company, my dear, dear old friend, my, my teacher, the, the man who's been like a father to me. That is Andre. Andre Ladoux. We must help him at yeah, once. Well, listen, Miss Ordway, why He's don't you... Sorry. Uh, Mr. Marlowe, I, I feared for some time that Andre was on the brink of losing his mind. Yeah, I can understand it. You see, it. he's a genius, tormented by a thousand frustrations. He will never dance. He, he's been crippled, but he is consumed with a passion for dancing and drives himself to express his genius through the clumsy feet of others. Yeah, well, that's very interesting. You've no idea, but I don't see why you came to me tonight, Miss Ordway. What can I do? Help me to find him. Yesterday, so something else happened to Andrea. I don't know what, but it upset him. Then today at noon, when this awful rain started... He disappeared and... Oh, good heavens. Huh? Five past eight. Yeah, what about it? I'll be late for the performance. Here, take this ticket and please come to the theater, Mr. Marlowe. I beg you. I, I'll pay you anything you ask. Only, only promise me you'll come. Well, please, I... Please, uh... please. Okay, Miss Ordway. I'll be there as soon as I can. <laughs> Ballerina swept out of my apartment like a frightened whirlwind. As I got dressed all over again for an evening ballet, which I needed like acute appendicitis, I saw that the ticket she'd left was number 27J at the Great Arts Theater, showing Ballet of the World, sponsored by one Mrs. Imogene Wyatt. Well, I got to the lobby half-soaked near the end of the second act, when an icy usherette shoved a program at me and hush-hushed me inside. The audience was a small cluster of arty diehards down front, which left me and 27J feeling like Midway Island, my client, Vivian Ordway, was the whole show. When I saw the finale coming, I slipped down a side aisle and into the wings, just in time to catch a beef at the stage door between a long, She's wolf-faced right, intruder and a pudgy doorman. Here, Scully Haskell. But even if she was, you wouldn't get in. She left strict orders. <laughs> You're finished. Now get out and stay out. Okay, but let me tell you something. I broke my back getting publicity for that diamond studded widow in this outfit. Maybe Jean Wire's going to be sorry she fired me. I'm going to see to it personally. Get out of the theater, Scully. You're nuts. To you and his whole troop of stuck-up grasshoppers. Oh, Mr. Marlowe, yeah. here. Come this way to my dressing room. Tell me, have you heard from Andre Ledoux, Vivian? No, no, nothing. But I did remember something that may help. Oh? Andre once mentioned that he had a friend here in Los Angeles, a Mr. Baker, who, who lived at the Winthrop Arms, the, the Winthrop Hotel, the, the Winthrop something. Uh -huh. Come in, Mr. Marlowe. Thank you. Andre may be there. I'm, I'm grasping at straws, I know. But if, if his mind is gone and, and he is lost, I, oh, I'm... I'm so afraid for him. Oh, now take it easy, honey. Take it easy. Vivian, hmm? is there news of Andre? Oh, no, George, nothing. M Mr. Marlowe here is going to find him for us. He he's a private detective. Oh, I see. Wonderful. I am George Melnikov. Glad to know you. Vivian, I'll be at the hotel. If I can help, please do call on me. Mm. And, oh, 
My dear, you shone as beautifully tonight as the full moon. Kakrasivuya luna. We mere stars were hardly visible beside you. Do svidanya, Dushka. Fast man with a compliment, huh? He's very sweet. Yeah, what hotel did he mean? The Wilshire Gardens. Most of the ballet stayed there. Oh. How about you, Miss Ordway? Uh, I have a house, a studio on Lookout Mountain, 857. 857. Yeah. Can I reach you there? No, no, I'm going to wait here in the theater. If Andre should remember and come back, I, I'd want to be here. He's a very sick man. After I left the theater, a quick check in a phone book showed a Winthrop Arms apartment hotel on Havenhurst Drive. It's just below Fountain Avenue. When I got there, I found the name Baker stuck over the mailbox to apartment 1A. I went inside and up to the door. Yes? Andre Ledoux? What do you want? Well, your friends at the theater are worried about you. My friends? I have no friends. George Melikoff's worried about you. George Melikoff. My friends, what is it? So is Vivian Ordway. Vivian? Uh-huh. Oh, that dear child, what will become of her now? What do you mean? What's happened? Who are you? Miss Ordway sent me to find you. She's waiting for you at the theater. Waiting at the theater? Why? Why? The ballet is finished. What's that? Mrs. Imogen Wyatt withdraws her support completely. There is no more ballet du monde. I'm penniless. And all our work has been for nothing. I tried to reason with her, but... Oh, it was hateful. Hateful. Afterward, I drove here on the dark street. The rain slashing, clawing at me. Rain. Andre, where is your friend, Mr. Baker? Hmm? This place is packed in mothballs. Oh, he is in Europe. It is all right that I am here. He sent me the keys long ago, said I could use his apartment in this car. I came here to be alone, to think. My head, my head aches. aches. Andre, what time was it when you left Mrs. Wyatt yesterday? Do you uh, remember? I can't remember. Only that it was dark, very dark, and it was such a difficult drive. Yes, tomorrow she will notify her lawyer to alter the papers and order that imbecile. I wish she were dead. You hear me? I wish that Imogen Wyatt were dead. What was that? Stay where you are. What is it? Do you see anything? No. Now look, Andre, about your headache. Hmm? Wouldn't you like to see a doctor? Doctor? No, no, I'll be all right. I, I am all right, understand? Yes, yeah, sure, sure. Well, do me a favor for your own sake. Hmm? Stay here tonight, inside. I want to check a couple of things and then I'll be back. Yes, I'll stay. Where else would I go? Now? When I left, I was convinced that if the ballet impresario hadn't already slipped his trolley, another slight bump would do it. But two things bothered me. So first I walked around to the window again, but any trace of an eavesdropper had been washed away by the rain. Item number two was the strong imprint the drive home in the rain had made on Andre's troubled mind. I wanted to know why. The garage was under the building on the far side. The door was unlocked and a small light burned in the back. I finally found the car asleep close to the ground Hudson registered to Orlin Baker and found it with the first grim discrepancy. The left headlight and fender were still streaked with rain marks, but the right had been wiped clean. And when I reached in and switched on the lights, that cinched it. Glass in the right headlight had been replaced. It was brand new. Hey there. What are you up to? Just testing my friend's car. I may borrow it. You the attendant? Uh, that's right. Did you in here last night tinkering around with this here car? No. Maybe it was Mr. Ledoux. He had it out last night. Oh, no, it wasn't him. That was somebody else. Uh, I heard a noise. See him when I come out of my back room there. This guy beat it. He took off like a scared turkey. He had a big black cape on with a high collar flapping in the wind. You better watch it, old timer. That stuff's getting your eyesight. Mm, looked like a cape to me. Yeah. Well, I looked around, but I didn't see no harm done, so I went back to my room. Uh, uh, what time was all this? 
Oh, way past midnight. Maybe one, two o'clock. I didn't pay much attention. Uh-huh. <laughs> uh, by the way, Mr. Careful little nip. No, thanks. Mm. I'd like to use a phone. You got one? Oh, sure, sure, sure. Back in the corner. I- I'll show I'll you. I'll find it. The call is personal. Do you mind? Me? I should say not. Help yourself, Sonny. I'm too old to even be curious. My first call was to a desk sergeant in the police traffic bureau. And when I identified myself and asked about a hit-and-run accident, possibly on Fountain, sometime before midnight yesterday, there was a pause while he checked the record. And then... On the button, Mr. Marlowe. We identified him by his Blue Shield medical card. Oh? One Lyle Kretschauer. Uh-huh. Apparently stepped out from between parked cars on Fountain Avenue between Orange Drive and Roxbury. Was struck by an unidentified vehicle at about 11.10 last night. Mm. Conditions serious. Now, what do you know about this, Mr. Marlowe? I'll get in touch with you later, Sergeant. Thanks. Huh. Stepped out from between parked cars. <laughs> That's the it. Philip Marlowe. I want to talk to Vivian Ordway. Oh, hang on a second, Mr. Marlowe. She's right here. Okay. Have you found him? He's not very all right. Yeah, for the present. But listen, Vivian, i got to talk to Imogene Wyatt. Where does she live? Oh, Mrs. Wyatt. Yeah. Uh, Beverly Hills. Let, let me think. It's 21 Cameo Terrace. 21 Cameo. Meet me there right away, will you? I may have a couple of rough answers for you, baby. But I'm still in costume. That doesn't matter. Okay. All right. I, I put something on over it. I'll be there just as soon as I can. Between slick streets and visibility zero, it was a solid half-hour drive from the Winthrop Arms out to the swank cameo terrace. But when I pulled up at number 21, I wondered what the wealthy widow had spent her money on. The house was so small, it must have been shingled with $20 bills to meet the zoning restrictions. I just started up the soggy gravel path toward the door when it came. As I started to run for the house, a green convertible I hadn't noticed before roared to life suddenly and disappeared down a side street. I didn't have time to worry about it. Inside, I... I found Mrs. Wyatt on her dining room floor. Fighting a losing battle with the distance to the telephone. Accident. Last night. I... I was going to ruin it all. Now, Andre let him... me... She was dead. I looked through the rest of the small and now silent house in a hurry, but found nothing more constructive than the rear door wide open. I got back to the living room just in time to see my client, Vivian Ordway, bizarre in a short, frothy ballet skirt and long white hose, standing in the front door. Something's wrong, isn't it? It's one way to put it. How'd you get here, Vivian? In the cab. What do you know that drives a green convertible? A green with uh, Scully Haskell, a publicity man, but why? The guy I saw in a beef at the theater tonight. What's happened? Imogene Wyatt was just shot to I... death. And that puts two items of business up on deck. First, the check call to Andre Ledoux. Andre? Why Andre? On the off chance that he can drive faster than I can. After that, a personal call on Mr. Haskell. You can fill that one in yourself. Marlowe, Andre couldn't have. He couldn't have We'll done... see. Now, hang on tight, baby. Let's get it over with. In just a moment, the second act of Philip Marlowe. But first, the great international comedian Beatrice Lilly will be Bing Crosby's guest on CBS this Wednesday night. The CBS Bing Crosby show always guarantees enjoyment. So be listening when B. Lilly joins Bing on most of these same CBS stations this Wednesday night. And now with our star, Gerald Moore, the second act of Philip Marlowe. And tonight's story, The High-Colored Cape. made a cockeyed picture. A beautiful ballerina miles away from the stage, yet in full color drenched costume and gaping through tear streaked grease paint. It's sudden death. It's a good time for me to start checking up. Andre Ledoux, the high-strung impresario, was first. If he was still at the apartment, I could cross him off as having done it personally. Hello? Hello, who is it you want? 
Sorry, wrong number. Marlo, he was home, wasn't he, Andre? I mean, you couldn't suspect him, Marlo. Why, Andre's the sweetest man in the world. Take it easy, honey. I didn't say Ledoux did it. And his being home doesn't say he didn't. People sometimes pay other people to do their dirty work for him, you know. Just what are you trying to say? You hired me to find Ledoux, and I did. But also, I found he was suffering from shock, and has been since last night when Mrs. Wyatt told him she was going to fold the show. Fold the show? Yeah, yeah. And that Vivian would ruin him. And half a dozen more I could name. You're so right, so you've all got plenty of motive. But what about Haskell? We know he hated Mrs. Wyatt. Isn't revenge motive? Revenge and the fact that you saw his car. Why do you insist on defending him? I don't. Only there's another angle. It's called hit and run. And I know that it ties in tight with Ledoux, Mrs. Wyatt, and the actual killer. Hit and run? I, I, I don't understand. Well, neither do I yet. Now, look, do you know where Scully Haskell lives? No. Where does he hang out? Uh, sometimes at, at the bar at Wilshire Gardens Hotel. Okay, I'll try it. Now you go back to your place up in the hills. I'll find out when I got some answers. Now, hurry up and get out of here, will you? Somebody might have heard the shot and called it. Somebody did hear the shot. Go on, get out. Yes, but Marla, No I... buts. Go on, Vivian. Get in the cab and go straight home. Do your crying there. All right. Good. I'm trying to... Hey, hey, Vivian, you forgot your coat. Vivian, you... you... Oh, no, baby. You forgot your cape. For a long second, I just held it tight and stared. High Elizabethan color enough gathered cloth to rig old Ironsides. It could have been what the garage attendant thought he had seen running away from the car Ledoux had used. But the garage attendant could have been mistaken, too. I told myself that leaping high to conclusions were strictly for ballet dancers. I jammed the cape into a small bundle and leapt via the service entrance just as the police sirened up. I took the great circle route back to my car, tossed the cape on the seat next to me, and drove fast to the bar at the Wilshire Gardens Hotel. kind of flattering pink mirrored place where the hors d'oeuvre had long ago replaced the pretzel. But Haskell wasn't in sight. And the only person around who could possibly be of any help to me was the delicate George Milikoff. Mr. Margot, have you seen Vivian? I am beside myself with worry. She's all right, Milikoff. She's not. I know. It is Monsieur Ledoux that she still worries about him. Yeah, him and a little bit more, George. Now tell me, you know where I can find Scully Haskell? Why, yes, I do. He was just here for a drink. Where'd he go? You're being very brusque, Mr. Marlowe. Being very what? You're brusque. Brusque, yeah, well. Now look, George, without grand jetting out of your satin loafers, get this. There's been a murder, and Vivian's in it up to a pretty fluff skirt. A murder? How is Vivian concerned? Come on, Butch, let's get out of here. Where are we going, Mr. Marlowe? Out to my car where we can talk. The rain stopped, come on. Over here. You, uh, you said somebody was murdered. Who was that? Mrs. Wyatt. She was shot. It might have been Haskell. Because she discharged him? Maybe. Or maybe something more complicated, like a hit-and-run accident that belongs to Ledoux, but somebody wants to cover. Does that make any sense to you? Here's a car. No. Should it? No. What's more, it shouldn't to Vivian, either. What are you getting at? There isn't time to explain. Call it thinking out loud. Thinking about this cape, for example, that belongs to Vivian. And about the testimony of a whiskey garage attendant. All of which makes me hope real hard that Haskell's the boy. More thinking out loud. Yeah, maybe. Now, look, where can I find Haskell? The Paradise Court Motel on Vine. He has a bungalow there, number three. Oh, thanks, thanks. Well, if you're really worried about Vivian, George, go on up to a place on Lookout Mountain Road. She's not in good shape. And here, take this cape with you. G- you ooh. Uh, what? Why, you cut yourself. Your finger's bleeding. Yeah. On a sliver of glass, George. Glass that could have come from a broken headlight, huh? From a broken what? What are you talking about, Mr. Marlowe? The benefit of the doubt, George. Keeps getting harder to give it away. Bring this back to Vivian, will you? Tell her she left it at Mrs. Wyatt's and that I'm positive Haskell's our man. So long, George. Not quite. The name's Marlowe. I want to talk to you, Haskell. Don't waste your breath, Skip Chaser. I'm broke, and I'm going to stay broke until the first of next month. After that, you can get in line. 
Who are you funny for, the finance company? Imogene Wyatt's dead, Haskell. What did you say it? What's a gun for? You lousy temper. Get back. Hey, wait a minute. I saw you at the theater tonight. Yeah, and I heard you, which puts me out in front. Now, do we talk, Haskell? Well, what? Mrs. Wyatt's murder. You were sloppy. And you're off your nut. I didn't shoot her. I didn't even... Slips, huh, kid? So I, I know she was shot. Doesn't prove I did it. Come on, why'd you kill Mrs. Wyatt? I did How'd you know she was shot? Because it happened just I got out of my car and started toward her place. I was going up there to read her off. The shot scared me away. Use your head, Marlowe. I was sore, but I didn't kill her. No, but interference on that hit and run you were covering was plenty of reason. What are you talking about, hit and run? Hit and run! Don't move, Haskell. Ah, nuts. Come I on said in, don't Haskell. move! Congratulations, handsome. That's just what I had in mind. Close the door and stand still. Sure. Now what? The name's Nancy Connick. Occupation? Ex-friend of the unconscious. <laughs> Don't look so worried, handsome. I'm on your side. I had something in mind exactly like that left cross you just threw. Is that cold, hmm? Yeah. What's your beef? I took this louse to a party with me last night, and he got so stinking drunk that I'm still apologizing to people. He was with you last night? Mm -hmm. Me and a couple of fifths of bourbon from 8.30 till 5 a.m. down on Malibu. He never left? Uh, not for a second. The hmm. loud mouth was positive. Nobody could get along without him. Uh, what's that got to do with you? Too much. Tell Haskell I'll be in touch, will you? I got to run now. Uh, oh. What are you looking at? It's just a program from the ballet, isn't it? Hmm? Yeah, yeah. Pascal has them all over the place, after all. Yeah, can. sure, sure, sure. So? Hmm? Oh, so like I said, Nancy, I gotta run. It was 15 stop-and-go minutes from Haskell's place at the Hollywood Hills, and another five screeching up the paved snake that was Lookout Mountain Road. But finally, I was there out of my car and running toward number 857, which was a collection of windows in a rustic log frame half jutting out into space. And around in the back, there was a wooden sun deck. Below it, on either side, huge rocks that lined the edge of the cliff. Directly below, only the dark, bottomless canyon. On the end of the porch near me, there was a long flight of stairs. And I started up, one careful, noiseless step at a time. My hand tight around the 38. Suddenly, in the weak light of the thin slice of moon, I saw Vivian Ordway. A back to the flimsy porch rail, a face, an ugly knot of terror. Oh, George. And only no. inches away from her and brandishing the no gun he'd used to kill me. Mrs. Wyatt. Listen was the half crazed me. answer to everything. Listen. The delicate George. Please. Melikoff. Listen. Please. It's too late, Vivian. Marlowe knows this cape was what the garage attendant saw. And do you know how? Because of a stupid little thing. A sliver of glass that was caught in it, which came from the broken headlight that the wearer of the cape replaced. The wearer who was covering up Andre Ledoux's hit and run accident so that he could have the pig where he wanted him. You're wrong, George. Marlowe was after Haskell. He thinks Haskell killed Mrs. Wyatt. He only hopes that. And he'll find out, one way or another, that the beautiful ballerina is guilty. Then he'll be forced to come back here after you. But, George, I'm not guilty. Of course you're not, Vivian. I am. The cape is mine, not yours. You only used it tonight. That's the only thing he doesn't know and never will. Because you will have killed yourself after confessing to me. No, no. It's the only way, Vivian. You or me. But it's always been that way, hasn't it? Even in the ballet, where one or the other of us had to be starred. Too bad it wasn't I. Yeah, crying shame, Malachi. Oh, 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 oh. Get away from that rail, Vivian. He's going to the other end of the porch, Milo. He's going to jump with the ground there. Malachi, no! Oh. Great a leap, even for a belly dancer. Let's get out of here. Took a long time at police headquarters, but finally all concerned had made their statement. The law was more or less satisfied, and Andre Ledoux never knew he'd hit anyone, was cleared of hit and run. That left me and the ballerina driving to a friend's house. But she was going to spend the night. Phil, I, I know you must have had enough of questions and answers, but... But? Yes. The reason George killed Mrs. Wyatt, hmm? 
Well, you see, Vivian, it started last night when George went to see Andre Ledoux because he was so bitter about his part in the show being cut down. And that was when he saw Andre returning from Mrs. Wyatt, shaken up and half-dazed. And uh, with a broken headlight and, and other signs of having hit someone, huh? Yeah, yeah. And from there, George thought fast, covered it all up, found out exactly what had happened from this morning's paper, probably, and waited. Ah. But when you hired me tonight, he must have followed me to Ledoux's and overheard Andre tell me that Mrs. Wyatt was going to pull out. Oh, so he went to her, tried to stop her, and, and, and couldn't. Anything else? Oh, yes. Oh, one thing. Oh, that's the house there, Phil. They do like Oh, thing. okay. What made you hurry back to my place from Haskell's motel when, when time meant so much? A hunch, honey. As I was leaving Scully Haskell's, I saw a stack of ballet programs on a table in his living room. The cover on it was very interesting. It features you and the picture of George, majestic in his high-colored cape. So that was it. Yeah, that was it. Good night, Phil. Oh, will you call me tomorrow sometime, please? I'll call you. Tomorrow, Vivian. Good. Oh, it's a nice night, Phil. And so good to be alive. Well. Good night. Well, I drove straight home in the quiet, empty hour through the quiet, empty streets, thinking all the way about ballet, which to me had always been something very delicate. You know, for the long hair, strictly the arty side. <laughs> and I thought about the people I'd met who were connected with it. The ballerina with a lot of courage when courage counted. The high-strung Andre Ledoux, Haskell the muscle man, and George. As vicious as anything I'd ever met on Skid Row. And I was still thinking about them when I got out of my car. But then for the first time, I noticed a little white envelope on the seat next to me. It had my name on it. And inside was a, a ticket for tomorrow's matinee. Same seat I had before. Yeah, well, I figured I'd go. You know, those, those leaps they do, they're, they're pretty good. What do you call them? Uh, entre, entre... Uh, no, uh, two is you... Yeah, they're pretty good. The Adventures of Philip Marlowe, bringing you Raymond Chandler's most famous character, star Gerald Moore, are produced and directed by Norman MacDonald and are written for radio by Robert Mitchell and Gene Levitt. Featured in our cast were Georgia Ellis, Edgar Berrier, Elliot Reed, Lou Krugman, Wilms Herbert, and Michael Ann Barrett. The special music is composed and conducted by Richard Arant. <laughs> Be sure and be with us again next week when Philip Marlowe says... This time it was a fishy horseplay from a red-headed beauty wild about ponies past a black-bearded sailor who bled to death on a racing form to a neck-and-neck -neck finish over a wandering seahorse worth 50,000 bucks. And you know what? I was the jockey. Remember, every Wednesday night, CBS brings you Groucho Marx with his wonderful quiz, You Bet Your Life. It's one of the brightest, most spontaneous, most genuinely funny shows on the air, so be listening this Wednesday night on CBS. This is Roy Rowan speaking. Now, stay tuned for Pursuit, which follows immediately on most of these same CBS stations. This is CBS, where Burns and Allen are heard every Wednesday night, the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs>